right, guys. Welcome to the Cyber Monday Title Gardens live show. Hope everybody's having a good, I guess, end of their weekend, start of their work week, and enjoying all the, the bounty of the internet as far as uh, good deals go. So real quick in chat, let me know if you can hear me okay. Sometimes when I just initially start up a live stream, sometimes my audio is a little bit messed up. So hopefully everything sounds good. Uh, so first of all, let's do the audio check. Let me know if, uh, if you guys can hear me okay. And then the next thing I want you to let me know is what is the best thing you guys have bought either for Black Friday or Cyber Monday? I'm kind of curious to see what you all got because I can tell you from my end, I really didn't buy anything that was on sale. That's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like it's supposed to be like the big, you know, savings time of the year. I did nothing. All the stuff that I bought, I pretty much bought retail because like the, the some of these things just never go on sale or something. Okay, sound is perfect, good. You know what, I'm gonna tweak this a little bit. Yoink. Okay, because the mic wasn't exactly pointed in my direction. So hopefully that works out. Sound is perfect, good, good. Okay, spent 1500 today, ouch. Can hear you a little high. A little high as in like the volume's a little loud? Maybe. I'll turn it down slightly, unless you guys are having a difficult time hearing me, and then I'll turn it back up. Okay. Tristane's Reef, I bought an automatic neck cleaner for the skimmer, very cool. That's one of the things that I do plan on, on picking up at some point. Um, I don't think any of my skimmers are suited for it, I'm not really sure. Uh, but that's one of those things that I kind of think would save so much time and it helps so much with just keeping stuff well maintained. Checking stuff out here. Uh, cool, Ryan from BRS gave you a shout out. Aw, that's so nice of him. So I've only met him, met Ryan a couple times, real nice guy. I typically uh, would only see him at trade shows and things like that. And knowing me, I don't get to those very often. So that's very cool of him. He's been streaming all week. It's like, man, it's like, that's crazy. So my mom's in here closing the blinds when it's pitch black out, by the way. So it's like really gross and dark and rainy here. <laughs> so let's see what else is going on. How many items today? So Gabriel, uh, we have got a little over 200. Uh, Fan, how was Thanksgiving? It was really good. Uh, so my, f my family and I, we never actually um, do a Thanksgiving dinner. We're almost always going to somebody else's Thanksgiving dinner. So sometimes like the Burmese community will get together and they'll do like a Thanksgiving dinner. Sometimes I'll go to that. Um, but then there's like, after Thanksgiving lunch. yeah, yeah, we did like an after Thanksgiving lunch. So, but like this, this particular year, I went to see my friend up in Cleveland. See you later. So the, the, the title of mom is taken off. So uh, I had, I had a Thanksgiving dinner with him and his family and I kind of feel honored because I guess like I was the last person to make the cut. The only people at that dinner were like his family and like a couple of significant others and then me. And I guess there was like a bunch of other people that wanted to go and they got told that, you know, nope, space is all full. But dinner was good. And the next day I was talking to him and he was cleaning up after Thanksgiving dinner. And he was just saying, you know what, I should mandate people take all the, like have to take something home because there's so much food here, it's just gonna go bad. And I was just like thinking, I would have taken all of it. It just never occurred to me because I didn't see anybody else take any food home. It's like, I would have taken every single last bit of it. I'm so broke. So anyway, actually I'm not that broke, but I'm not gonna turn down like Thanksgiving leftovers either. You look small next to that tank. You know what's funny? That's about how big that is. Like, uh, I, I don't know which, which view you just saw, 
But some of those tanks that you see in the background there, they're eight feet long. Uh, I can hear with just a little echo. So the little echo is a couple of things. So I'm using a different microphone than usual. I'm using a shotgun mic rather than like a lavalier because I don't really want to clip anything. Like if I have a guest, we both wear lavaliers and that's a good way to separate us. But otherwise, I'll, I would just use a shotgun mic. Unfortunately, this shotgun mic is extra sensitive to like the echo that's in the room. There's really not a lot of echo, but any bit of echo that you do hear, this microphone picks up. Volume's clear but super low on desktop. Okay, well there's a couple of things I can do. And so I think I have like the, you know, I'll, I'll just speak up louder, how's that? I'll just speak up a bit because the there is like a noise reducer that's on that might be bringing the, the noise floor down a little bit and reducing some of that echo that you hear. Otherwise, I think it might be a little bit too boomy and weird, so I'll just try to speak up. Uh, let's see, Than, what was your your Black Friday Cyber Monday pickup? So, unfortunately, like it's not it's super exciting stuff. The the one thing that I am kind of pleased about is that we were able to get um, the fiber optic line from the house all the way run to this building, and we were able to then get internet into this building, but we didn't have wireless or, or anything. And so one of the people uh, that was you know commenting on, on I think the, the update video, we he was suggesting to, to go with enterprise grade hardware. And I, I was kind of heading towards like a lot of the consumer grade stuff. So they, I, I read a little bit more about like the enterprise grade stuff and I ended up getting um, some like routers and stuff like that. So one of the things was like, uh, well, these are like the, like the small mesh modules, but I'm, I'm putting together like a new Wi-Fi network back here. And just because we have like four different buildings that I really want to get Wi-Fi at. And these guys are pretty good. So these are like exterior Wi-Fi mesh extenders by uh, Ubiquity. So Ubiquity is used in like, you know, enterprise operations, hospitals, things like that. And so far we, we have two units working downstairs and it covers the whole building. And it's just a matter of then extending that. So I guess this is my big purchase. It's like a whole new internet. <sighs> Rico's Aquariums, hello everyone. Hey Rico. So I think Rico was streaming a little bit earlier and I'm sure he's gonna be streaming a little bit later too. <laughs> so what's up Rico? Harkins got an Orphic Atlantic V4. What's your thought about them? Uh, you know who likes Orphic was, the, was my friend Nathan who was on my last week's live sale. He um, loves the Orphic Atlantic and I haven't played with like the, the V4 version of it but uh, he's super happy with the coloration of his corals and the growth and everything. My only problem with them is they're very goofy to shoot video of or shoot pictures of in general. There's just something about like um, about like the, the wavelength or something that really messes with sensors. You have any cheap frags? Uh, there's some. Yeah, there, there's, there's definitely some that are, are on clearance pricing here. I got a $2,500 trophy fish, a sail fin for $20 at a flea market at the beach. <laughs> really? Uh, Acidic Burrito's asking, do you ever run out of room for corals? Yes. And so what do you do with the excess stock? Well, we try to move uh, volume whenever possible, right? But then, uh, sometimes when we're unable to do that, we just sell gigantic colonies for what... So usually we sell stuff that can fit in like a, a four ounce container, but for, like so sometimes being local helps. Uh, sometimes we'll charge like the same price for something much larger, just to, just to move out volume and get, um, oh, what is it? Just to, just to free up some real estate. Okay. 
So uh, I apologize in advance to the Facebook crowd that's watching. Most of the activity chat-wise happens on YouTube, so sometimes I kind of neglect checking uh, Facebook. But Mark Krause is asking, you allow local pickup, right? Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Krause says, uh, Randy gave you a shout out on BRS feed. Oh, very cool, very cool. Facebook is like the most difficult thing to navigate. Like, why is this so hard? Bizarre. Okay. Oh, and of course, like Facebook Messenger is now beeping at me. Great. Anyway, sorry about that. Nathan, how about those Buckeyes? The Buckeyes stomped the crap out of my team. So if you guys don't know, I went to Michigan. <laughs> that went poorly for me. But it's like every other team locally won. So I guess it was a little bit better. Like my, my Cleveland Cavaliers that are trying to lose are beating teams. And the Browns won. But no, my alma mater didn't perform that well. So Nathan's probably just loving life. He went to OSU, I went to Michigan. Bad weekend for that. Do you ever run a space? What do you do? Build a huge building. Yeah, there's that too. One of these days we'll get this we'll get this building up. Okay, 5 p.m. Let's uh let's go ahead and start the show. Okay, so I've got a little bit of random last minute drama that I was facing to set this show up. Normally, I would have like this file that you're seeing uh, playing behind me, all finished and everything like that. Um, just completely done the night before. But this time, for whatever reason, I thought we might be able to squeeze it in just to finish up the last bits and get that thing uploaded. Not quite so much the case. It turns out when you're processing files uh, that are like over two hours long, it takes a little while. And so on my machine, which is no slouch, uh, it, I was looking at five hours to stabilize the footage and then another five hours to then export the video. And it was noon, so I'm like, I can only choose one of these two. <laughs> so clearly I chose to not stabilize the footage. So you might see a little bit of jerkiness in the, in the footage as it, as it moves. But otherwise, um, it was the only way to, to, to get it up and running. So I was kind of like sweating a little bit because you're just sitting there staring at the progress bar. And um, it's like, it's still at 0%, you know, 10 minutes later, it's like at 1%. So I'm like, okay, this is getting really scary. So we timed it out, like, I should be ready by about 4.30. So I'm just hoping that like everything actually compiles properly because sometimes what happens is, uh, you see like here, number three red ring zoanthids, that text. Sometimes what happens is uh, it just re reverts that text. So it just says text, 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 text doesn't say anything. And I'm like, if that happens, no live show, right? But anyway, um, real quick, two please. I did see your live, uh, your super chat. Thank you so much. Everybody gives a thumbs up. Uh, Facebook blows. Uh, uh, Nick Korn with the little wave on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook at 15 seconds ahead. Yeah, so guys, if you want to sneak in. So it's it's funny because Facebook usually starts ahead. I don't know if it stays ahead. Two please, again with the $1.99 super chat. Thanks, thank you so much. So two please is like, I don't know, he's like the de Medici of the, of the live, ch of the YouTube live chat world. He just like, just constantly just drops Drops the dollar ninety nine, which helps out tremendously. Really, it does. Oh, let's see. 
Yeah, rendering video takes forever. Yes, it does. Uh, can I use a discount code and a gift certificate? I think you can because those are two separate uh, line items. I don't think anybody's ever done it unless I just don't remember them doing it, but I think it is possible. Yeah, so one of my friends, when I purchased my computer, uh, again, not no slouch computer, it was um, really, really, really super powered. It's like all enterprise grade stuff, cost a fortune. And he was like saying, you'll never need that much power. And lo and behold, I'm sitting here looking at five hour render times now. Eduardo, greetings from the Czech Republic. Welcome, Eduardo. Robert Baker's like, you're the best dressed coral farmer ever. <laughs> thank you. It's also a low bar. <laughs> it's, uh, thank you, appreciate it though. No, it's like for Cyber Monday, I kind of went with like the, like the Matrix theme thing. And I would have like wore the glasses and everything, like the sunglasses, but then I'm like, it's so dark that that's, I would just be blind. So I voted, I, I, I voted against that. Wazo Productions, how do you get your frags? Uh, we get our corals in general from a number of different sources. Um, we do work with an importer, and these days I would say that he buys about as much from us as we buy from him. It's really close. Uh, the other thing that we get corals from are a lot of local hobbyists, because when you're focused on aquaculture the way that we're focused on aquaculture, you tend to not need super volumes of just random stuff. So ordering a lot of wholesale corals doesn't make a ton of sense because we're really only interested in like really like the top 5%, maybe even the top 1% of, of coral varieties out there. So we try to have a little bit of everything, but when we're, when we're really shopping, we just want like some very nice things. And occasionally that means just going out and just spending retail to get that one piece and then growing it out, hopefully forever. Stream buffer is killing me. Is that on my end or is that on your end? Are you guys, uh, if, if you're having issues on YouTube, huh, is YouTube for some reason getting jerky or something. They're usually pretty good. I'm like looking at my drop frame rate, <clears throat> which has me wondering if it's on your end because I'm only dropping 23 frames so far. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jessica J, can I elect to have UPS ship instead? I have not had good luck with FedEx. Funny you mention that, Jessica. So the past couple weeks, we've had all kinds of issues with FedEx. Um, and there's like a 90 something percent chance I'll be switching to UPS really soon here. So, uh, so Jessica, if you just like, if you, if you place any orders, if you decide to place any orders, just say, wait for UPS, because there's a really good chance that not this coming week, um, so this coming week, we're probably going to still be using FedEx. The week after, we're probably going to be on UPS. So I didn't, like one of, my, one of the uh, other people that I talked to in the industry, he, he switched to UPS, said it was the best thing he's ever done. And I'm like, I've used UPS before. I didn't really see it was any different. I, I was really happy with my rep, and I saw no reason to switch away from FedEx. And shortly after I said that, it all went to hell. Like, they screwed up so many shipments. They beat the heck out of the, the boxes. Like, whenever we did have an issue, it's like, they said, yeah, like the box is completely smashed. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they just took an extra day for no reason whatsoever. Like a package would be going down to Florida and it would get rerouted back to New Jersey, then back to Florida, take an additional day and cause all sorts of issues. And then I got a different rep, and this new rep is completely not like the previous rep that was amazing. He's just completely unresponsive. So I think, I think now's the time to, 
to see how the other side lives. Isn't UPS and contract talks at the at the moment? I have no idea. UPS sucks by me. I don't even know if there's I don't know if there's that many great shipping companies anymore. I don't know really what what's going on with the shipping, but it's different. It's clearly different than the last the last several years. Anecdotally, a whole bunch of really large sellers in this industry had switched away from FedEx and moved on to UPS. So I might be following that little trend. Yeah, Death Mage. I don't get my stuff until 8 p.m. and sometimes it doesn't even come. That's a, that's a similar problem that we had recently with FedEx. Uh, there's one person that had to, uh, he had to go pick it up because they weren't going to deliver it for some reason. And then it was like an hour away. He, then he had it sent to his work address the next time. And they were late there too. And he had to go pick it up an hour away. Yeah, every shipping company has their issues. I mean, there are, and I understand it to a large degree that there are going to be issues. But there's stuff that even amongst that seems really uncharacteristic. And that's what's kind of... Uh, getting me a little on edge because I mean it, it's even down to like every interaction that I have with them is getting like goofier and goofier so like the rep is weird like the drivers are all different so it's it's bizarre <laughs> USPS seems to do better than most that's really funny that you mentioned that because you know um, these guys here they were supposed to come on Sunday and the reason why they didn't come on Sunday is because they, they said that the mailbox, driveway, and front porch were inaccessible, which is impossible here. Like, our front road here is a state route. Like, nothing is obstructing it. My driveway is gigantic. Nothing is obstructing that. My porch is an open porch. And on top of that, we were home. And they, could, they said they couldn't deliver these. So it ended up showing up a day late. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wish there was like a perfect uh, shipping service out there, but I definitely have not found it. So yeah, we'll see. We will see. Yeah, they used that code to clear the route at the end of the day. You know what I, f I figured? I figured it was just the, the driver wanted to get home and watch the Browns game. Like, that's the only thing that I, that I could think of. It's like it's he's probably delivering right at kickoff time, and he's just like, uh-uh. I'm going to like flag all of these packages I have to deliver just so I can get home. <clears throat> Okay, let me catch up real quick on any Facebook comments here. Lindsay Bissell says, hello from Pittsburgh. Welcome. Luke Schnabel, what's up, Luke? I'm glad the sound panels are working. We have an acoustic engineer coming here this week to fix the echo here. Cool. So uh, Luke on Facebook, was his dad was the one that uh, was selling some of these sound panels that I had purchased. And I like them. I'm thinking about actually adding a few more, but there's a couple other bills I need to take care of before dropping down big money on more acoustic panels. Because theoretically, as, as, as soon as I start putting stuff into this room, uh, it'll sound a lot better. And I don't necessarily need the sound panels, but I'd like to. <laughs> okay, actual reef-related questions. DM's Reef Tank. How high should I put Radeon G4s over my 7 foot 24 by 24? It's 14 inches good. What do you think? Fan, thanks. Okay, so I tend to like to raise them up higher. The, the highest I've ever had lights over a tank was about 48 inches. And the coverage was really good. The, the spread was good. Um, and the intensity was fine because nobody really runs Radeons at 100%. But if you have them that far up, you can. 
So the reason why I tend to like to keep the lights a little bit higher, just to the point where uh, you you're you don't want the light to bleed into the room. But if as long as it's not doing that, I like them a lot higher for the simple fact that a lot of like splash and like salt creep type stuff will eventually get on those lights. And that's a huge pet peeve of mine. That's, that's a quick way to like degrade the, the longevity of these fixtures. Andrew Lighter, would you use calc and only alkalinity two part? Um, no. So if if I'm doing if I'm doing calc, you can definitely do all these together, but usually you want to keep it balanced if your water chemistry is already good. So if you're doing two part, um, your 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 best bet is to actually use both the calcium al and the alkalinity because calc by itself is also balanced. So I would expect that if you were just using calc and only the alkalinity component, you would slowly mess up your chemistry. Risky Biscuits, is there any SPS in today's sale? Yes, there is. In fact, uh, one thing that's, that's different about this particular uh, sale than a couple of the other ones is we're selling a few things in bulk. So you might only see like a picture of, let's say, Leptoceris or Pasilopora or Anacropora. But we'll say when there's more than one of those available. So you might not necessarily get just that piece for, for those items, but they're also like heavily discounted. I mean, I think that the least expensive one is about $8 or something. So you can kind of keep an eye out for that. But there's plenty of SPS on this show. <laughs> Brian Reef, who would choose to watch a Browns game? People dress up to watch Browns games here. It's pretty wild. Uh, Jeremy Young, is DHL still shipping? I think they're only international at this point. They used to be a thing, but I don't think that they're so much of a thing anymore. Did you inhale some turkey this weekend? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> this is pretty good stuff. Uh, how do you capture such good video of the corals? Kind of a loaded question. So one of the, the most difficult things to shoot video of, it's going to be stuff in an aquarium. <clears throat> it's dark. Like we, we spend all this money on lighting and we talk about like such high par values and stuff. The reality of the situation is it's actually a very dim subject matter to shoot. And then the, the fact that it's all artificial lighting can, can really mess with, uh, with camera sensors. So unfortunately, um, to, to get really high quality video footage, you kind of have to throw money at the problem and get a really good camera. That's, that's a start. <clears throat> but then once you start like moving that camera, that's a completely different problem. So the way that we're shooting this stuff right now, it's, it's on a motorized slider. Why do you never sell different types of leathers? Because the really good leathers right now aren't being imported anymore. So it takes a little bit of time to, um, to propagate those. We don't really even have a, a great large culture of those just yet. And the, the leathers that we do have, they're selling for astronomical prices. Like the like prices for leathers in the past would be about like two hundred, like twenty dollars, let's say, for a typical piece. They're selling for a lot more now because you just can't get them. Tristine Street, what millimeter is the macro lens you use? So this is a 100 millimeter macro. And how far from the corals? I would say less than six inches. <clears throat> okay, so quick question from Facebook. This is from Mike Lombard. How do I buy from Facebook? So you have to go to the website. So you have to go to titlegardens.com and you can just go to titlegardens.com slash live and that'll take you to the page where you will see the numbered list of all these corals. Um, yeah, actually, in the top, in the description of the video itself, you should, you should be able to see a link there as well. 
yeah, and if you're, if you're uh, wondering as to like how a live show works or how to uh, ensure that you actually get the corals and everything like that, because it, just filling up your shopping cart, that doesn't do it on its own. You actually have to complete the checkout process. There's like a, a frequently asked questions thing. Definitely check that out, Martin. So let's see, uh, Aaron Barajas, should I buy as you go <clears throat> and how is shipping handled? So right, so, so, so this is like the, the, the one live show where I didn't put uh, the little overlays at the bottom that says, you know, go here if you would like to purchase. Shipping is a flat rate $39.99. And so, yeah, I should probably cover all that. But if you do go to titlegardens.com slash live, you can see how all that works. So there's like a link saying like, click here to, to to uh, see the, the rules or you know how this all works but long story short it's a flat rate 39.99 shipping you pay that once but if you're over 250 shipping is free and when it's like a really busy live show sometimes it is good to check out each time that way you're you ensure that you get the corals otherwise somebody can just like swoop in purchase it before you complete the checkout process and then they would have that now uh, to avoid getting charged shipping multiple times, uh, as the shipping method, you can select live sale slash adding to uh, an existing order. Yes, I've bought some. They're expensive and hard to find, but I love them. Yeah, they're awesome. Like we um, we're slowly trying to propagate our leathers, but it's like it, again, it's a slower process. And like right now, we're just like so. Uh, so jammed up for space that it's hard to dedicate uh, you know that much space to them like we really need to get this building up and running here but it's it's like uh, it's not gonna happen before April so but once it does happen we, we're essentially gonna be I don't know ten times larger than what we have at the greenhouse so I'm obviously looking forward to that uh, Trevor Overbeck can Montipore eating nudibranch be on or slash eat pavona? You know, I've never seen that happen because we've had Montipore eating nudibranchs before on our Monty colonies. Uh, less so now because we have um, a constant predation by wrasses and, and damsels and whatnot. So we really haven't run into that issue. But even when we did have it in years past, to the point where we, we were losing entire like racks full of Montipora. It never seemed to bother Pavona. So the only thing, if you're seeing that sort of thing, I'm wondering if it's a Pavona specific nudibranch, which could be. Okay, so Rico just brought up the, the Tidal Gardens barbecue. We did kind of like a trial run last year and had some folks over, so hopefully all you guys had a good time. Uh, we're selling tickets for this upcoming one. It's not going to be for a while. It's going to be next summer, July 27th. But the link to that, I believe, is titlegardensbbq.eventbrite.com. So hopefully somebody can, can toss that link into chat for everyone. So is there a cap on barbecue tickets too, please? Uh, right now, I think the cap is at 150, but we can always raise it. Oops. And Luke, you'd better make it. You're local. There's the people are like flying in and stuff and getting hotel rooms and you're like 20 minutes away. You better make it, Luke. So zinnias and leathers are going up in price. It's funny that you mentioned that. So le leathers for sure. Like we charge very high prices for leather right now. Uh, Xenia, we're not charging more for it, but at the same time, we're having a hard time keeping it in stock. Like I bet if you went to Tidal Gardens right now, there might not be any available. That's entirely possible. And I have like, um, I've got one supplier that literally bothers me to like sell him hundreds at a time. So there's that. Thanks for taking a moment to break that down, Than. I'm on your site now. Terrific, great. I think I'll be in Montana that day. Man. Tyler Jacks, no guest today? No, so sometimes I, I do like to do one 
one solo every now and again. It's more me and you time, right? Oh man, I saw Xenia for 45. Yeah, it's crazy. Like there, there was a time and a place where, and, and people in certain geographies still might be living in this time and place where Xenia is like a throwaway trash um, pest coral practically. And I'm like, those days are over now because that stuff really isn't coming in. Did you guys try blue line pipefish for pest control? So Goron, I haven't tried the blue line. We used to have dragon face pipefish when, um, when, what are those things called? Red bugs were more of a thing. Like we haven't had red bugs in forever and we ended up getting some pumps that were a little bit too strong for those pipefish, unfortunately. So they kind of didn't make it. Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of the problem with pipefish for us, is that um, a lot of the tanks that we're going towards have tend to have higher flow, which doesn't really mesh with them. They might be really good for pest control, but I have not tried them. Any thoughts on Coral RX? I've heard it can be harsh, especially on acros. Uh, yes, we use it, and yes, it can be harsh on acros. Uh, we use really high concentrations too, so that's especially harsh. Um, it does a good job on certain things, like a really good job on certain things, and it does like very little job on other things. So for example, I think it does a pretty good job on flatworms and stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't do anything for the flatworm eggs, unfortunately, and it really won't do you a whole lot of good versus nudie bronx, uh, at least the ones that you really want to kill. Because they'll, they will, it will kill the the flatworms. Or I'm sorry, the, the nudibranchs. But they're so resilient that plenty of them will still survive. So that's kind of why I, I like to go with the fish method. Uh, Tim Foster, I haven't been getting emails for the live show. Ooh, Tim. So I think okay. So a, a little bit of background on the email situation. There is an email situation. We were using a service through our, um, through our, our, is it the ISP? No. It's whoever, our, our, our host, okay? And it dawned on us that this particular email pr uh, service provider was no good when we got blacklisted off of our own server. So we couldn't send emails to ourselves. And like the error code that it was being generated was there's too many complaints. And it's literally our transactional, we don't send out a newsletter, by the way. So it's not that, oh, we're spamming people. We're not. We're basically spamming ourselves because we wanted a copy of the shipment email. And, and because of that, uh, it somehow set off their algorithm and it blacklisted our own transactional emails to ourselves. So uh, we are working on that, on the whole email situation. Uh, in the meantime, just double check to, to make sure that it's not getting eaten up by your filter. But there is a weird little anomaly going on lately with our current email stuff. Harkins Aquatics, Zini or five bucks for a good piece at my local fish store. Cool. Yeah, I, I figured that like a lot of the the uh, the Indonesian ban type stuff hasn't really affected a lot of local places yet because um, a lot of, of especially smaller stores they don't tend to uh, buy in huge mega volumes. So I think a lot of this inventory just kind of hangs out there, uh, but. I think that once they start to like reorder and reorder and reorder, they're going to notice that uh, everything kind of looks pretty Australian right about now. Try mail gun, M A I L G U N. I'll have to check that out. So we were looking at um, oh shoot, what was, some somebody else made a, another suggestion. I forget what it was called, but I do know that uh, that our current one not that good. 
Adam, maybe I wasted money on Coral RX. No, you didn't waste money on it. There's, I don't think there's, there's a perfect dip out there. Uh, is it pretty much safe? Uh, is it safe for pretty much all LPS? Eh, it's okay. Bayer works. Bayer is also pretty harsh. I mean, it's if these dips can prevent one major outbreak from happening, it's worth its weight in gold. So the fact that it doesn't kill everything that's possible out there isn't that big of a deal. Risky Biscuits, I thought they lifted the Indo ban. Yeah, the, uh, the demise of the Indo ban was greatly overstated, as evidenced by the zeros of Indonesian corals going anywhere. So it looks like uh, it's going to be a pretty long and drawn out process. And welcome, Lisa's Aquatics. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, John Phelan, if I order today, can I pick up this coming weekend? Yes. Unless this coming weekend is some, something special, which I don't think it is. Yes. So like, uh, you can just send us an email, and we can, uh, we can set up a pickup. Brian's Reef, first time to the live sale. How does it work? Uh, what do you... What do you start showing? What is being sold? Okay. So I would recommend going to titlegardens.com slash live. And that will take you to a page that has this YouTube video embedded, as well as all the items below. So for example, we're on number 40, uh, the Fiji Rainbow Zealous for $25. And you can, if you would like this coral, you can go to that item number 40. It'll be just $25, like, like a blank box. Put that in a shopping cart and check out, just like a regular item. Uh, shipping is a flat rate $39.99, and it's free over $250. But there's also a little, uh, like an FAQ type um, little segment there that you should probably read. It goes into like much, uh, much deeper detail there. Mostly Reef says, I use Coral RX on everything except Acros and Chalice, but I use Bayer and Revive depending on where the frag came from. Yeah, like currently we, um, we're only using Coral RX, but we have used Bayer before. The only, my only issue with Bayer is that it's very difficult to, to see into it because it's cloudy, it's like milky inconsistency. Yeah, Martin Lombard on Facebook says, I'm in Nebraska and I have tons of Xenia in my tank and can't give it away around here. I actually trade for it locally. You know, if somebody has like a whole bunch on a rock, I'll, I'll trade them something for the whole rock. And what's up, Lawson? Hanging out on Facebooks. Martin Lombard is also saying, I can't find torch anywhere. Most of the torches that you're gonna find are coming from Australia. Um, almost no Indonesian torches are still hanging around. Uh, that's probably because there's like, there's really no aquaculture when that stuff is concerned. And um, like there's these big giant flatworms that eat euphilia and torches are like their favorite thing to eat. So you have to be careful with that. So Brian's Reef, yes, the, the numbers correspond to what we're showing here. So if you need to go back and see what one was, I think you can scrub back in the video to see. Just make sure the prices line up. Yes, JREG CG60 that basically said that. Jake Bentley, joining a little bit late, but super excited to be here. Welcome, Jake. Glad you could make it. Do you trade for Neon Green Toadstool? Yes, I do see Marvin. We just got a whole bunch, not a whole bunch, probably like five recently, and it was a healthy trade, let's just say. I think that like the person picked out probably like 10 corals. Yeah, pests are, pests are no joke, and, and it's especially important to, to kind of have um, you know, procedures and whatnot when you're talking about like a larger operation. It's one thing to have like a, a pest explosion happen in like a 20-gallon tank. It's like, oh no, 
you can really scour a 20 gallon tank like yourself you can you can be the the pest control device but when you have like 10,000 gallons it's never going to happen so you kind of have to like rely on other things and sometimes um, prevention relying on prevention ain't going to work like something's going to get through like eggs eggs are really good at surviving everything it's like the one of the most amazing things in the in the animal kingdom that's ever been um I guess like evolved or developed by by animals. It's like eggs survive everything. So yes, yeah, something just has to make it through, and then all of a sudden you have plague proportions if if you're not keeping it actively in check. That's kind of like why I advocate so much for different wrasses and damsels and stuff like that. Even if wrasses and damsels might not be your thing, they do such an important job on the reef. Jeremy Young. Title Gardens better start planning on your next expansion. So I, I'm wondering if like just the, the 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 stress and nuisance of this project has aged me ten years, and I've been really chill about this particular project too. I can't imagine doing a bigger one. No, it's certainly not. I'm not even done with this one yet. <laughs> still, still, uh, still knocking my head against the wall. I have a 30 gallon just discovered bristle worms. Adam, most bristle worms are fine. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much. I mean, bristle worms are part of just about every healthy reef aquarium. Now, again, if you are somehow like skeeved out by bristle worms, there are fish that really like to eat bristle worms. Uh, one off the top of my head would be a Pseudochromus fridmani. It's also called an orchid dotty back. It's a pretty little purple fish with a little some black marks here and there. Nice community fish that's really good at like sniping smaller worms. Two please, can brown jelly disease stay in your water column for a long time? I don't know if anybody really knows the answer to that. Um, see, brown jelly, typically from what I've seen, is like Ebola. It's so virulent, it's so deadly that it kills the host long before it can really spread anywhere. So usually when I see brown jelly, it's like a single head, bam, it's dead. And that's it. Like you just had like a head or two die of brown jelly and that's the end of it. Like you didn't really even have a chance to respond to it. It really didn't have a chance to go anywhere. Now, if you were worried about it being in the water column, what you could do is just use ultraviolet sterilization. And pretty much anything in the water column at that point is going to get knocked dead. Um, and the way that I know that is one time we had um, about a thousand gallons, let's say, a thousand gallons of water that developed that pea soup type stuff that sometimes ponds get to the point where you couldn't look into the tank two inches. It was, it was that thick. It was completely dense soup. And I was like, I have to do something about this. So I hooked up like a fairly large commercial um, UV sterilization unit. And I would say it took about 24 hours and that water was crystal clear. So if anything is actually in the water that you're concerned about, you have technology at your disposal to completely eliminate that risk, let's just say. Tidal Gardens, how do you keep up with the alkalinity, uh, calcium, magnesium demands of your frag tanks when corals are constantly being imported, exported? So there's two things that you can kind of do just as a blanket thing to make it very easy. One thing is frequent water changes. The second thing is a calcium reactor. Both of those things together are really good at maintaining a baseline. So that's a great starting point. Now, it's entirely possible for the demands of your, of your tank to just exceed you know, the capacity of both water changes and a calcium reactor. It is possible. At that point, you can consider doing two-part, you can consider doing um, calc wasser drips, but as a baseline, water changes in calcium reactor goes a really long way. Like the, the stocking levels that you would have to have um, would be pretty extreme.
Okay, let's see. Water on the floor. Regarding your recent video on polyp bailout, I think I observed some mushrooms bailing when I had them out of the tank for five minutes while while gluing some more mushrooms or frag rock. Very interesting. Um, so mushrooms are a little bit different. Now they can uh, they can propagate themselves by leaving little bits and pieces of their foot behind. They can also detach from rocks entirely, things like that. Uh, polyp bailout is kind of specific to stony corals. That's kind of why that's like a, a rare occurrence. I mean, it's basically them detaching from their own skeleton, not just detaching from a substrate in general, like a soft coral could do. Dave's nanotanks. If you have a lot of bristle worms, you're probably overfeeding. It's possible. Or there's just nothing uh, pre you know, predating them. Predatoring on them. <laughs> there's there's no uh, there's no predators. So we have like one tank that's just full of like flower anemones and another tank that's just full of um, mini carpet anemones. And there's just nothing in there but those things and worms. And there's lots of worms. Uh, risky biscuits. What's your favorite coral? I don't really have one. It's I mean some people are like it's like choosing you know between all your kids and. To me, it's not like that. <laughs> I don't even know why I brought that up. But it's more like I kind of I kind of enjoy just having a huge collection of them. So it's never really down to one coral. It just I just like to constantly just collect more and more and more different varieties like Pokemon, basically. So I think like the, the aggregate is what I enjoy. Tyler Jackson, Betty says Blastomusa. Blastomusa was really high on the list. Elegances were up there as well. Yeah. So I think I mentioned it before, guys, but we're on item number 54, and we're going to 200 and something. So definitely grab yourself a drink and hopefully, you know, but hopefully we all have enough calories to make it through this whole thing. So real quick in, ch in chat, so since uh, somebody did bring it up, what is everybody's favorite coral? Like I kind of like told you mine, but um, my non-answer. So if you guys have an answer for yourselves, by all means, let everybody know. Sometimes uh, it's it's interesting to to kind of get this like sound back and feedback, not because like oh this is like you know this is me thinking about marketing, but sometimes. Um, you'll see something in chat that you have no idea what it is and then you can go look it up and then it's like maybe you know maybe that also speaks to you know my interests I think bristle worms are great scavengers plus a cleaner crew yeah I agree I think that the the the, the majority of bristle worms in this hobby kind of have a bad rap self self vodka dosing myself so this whole live show today was kind of a cluster to put together. It's we, the, the, the fact that it was on a Monday kind of threw us off. So got a little weird and I was like watching this thing render for four hours leading up to this show. I'm thinking, hope there's nothing wrong in the, in the actual rendering process because I don't got another shot at this. We need to go live. And so when I was out at lunch, I just at the deli, uh, I found this stuff. So this is sake from Kyoto. And I was actually at this particular, are these sake breweries or distilleries? I don't really know. But the one thing that I do remember about the, the sake um, places there was that the what makes Kyoto in particular special is the quality of their water. So they get their groundwater from like uh, essentially like the runoff from from mountains that surround the, the the city of Kyoto, and what they pull up out of the ground is literally the most delicious water I've ever had in my whole life. And I'm just thinking, I bet this would be like the best place in the world to set up like a reef aquarium <laughs> because the water is so incredibly good, and you just just straight out of like a well. It's just delicious. It's so balanced and everything. And that, they credit that 
for how good their sake is. And the reason why I bring this up is because I was so stressed out just to get this video here produced. And I was like, I'm gonna need this for my live show. So we'll see. Fan, are you aquaculturing Recordia? Hard to find tank raised. Um, we are to some degree, but we need more space to do it. The problem with slower growing things is that you need to uh, provide more space to get the scale up. So a bird's nest, don't need that much space. They grow so quickly, but for longer term things, it definitely requires it. So we are doing a little bit of fragging here and there, but most of that stuff is, is getting imported from the Caribbean right now. KD, zero LRG, sitting on the side of the road. Uh, something about, blew out a tire, oh no. <laughs> but I still get to watch the show waiting for a tow, oh. That stinks, what, a, what an awful way to, to spend the evening. Green star polyps and xenia will be my next tank. Just those two corals and maybe I'll add a BTA. That'll be pretty cool. Okay, uh, Jeff Kennedy, I'm just getting back into salt water. What's the next best test kit to get after the basic ammonia nitrate and nitrite? Um, if you plan to keep stony corals, uh, it's a good idea to just to have some idea what your calcium and alkalinity looks like. If you have problems with your calcium and alkalinity, you might want to also look at your magnesium. Uh, I've done videos on, on all three of those, so definitely check those out as to like why you might be interested in, in those parameters. And then you might want to take a look at the kind of like the, the pollution ones. So take a look at, well, you already said nitrate, but I'd also look at phosphate. Two please, $1.99, thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you again, man. And thanks for the reminder. So uh, I don't beg for, for the thumbs up quite as much as like other streams do, because I don't, I don't know if, if the YouTube algorithm cares, but it is a nice little metric, isn't it? So what are we at right now? Like I'm probably seeing like something different than you guys are seeing. So hopefully we're over 100. I don't know. Hopefully we're over 100 likes. Does anyone know where I can get some cheap mushrooms? Ugh. Cheap mushrooms? I don't know. Like so, so I think some places might be cheaper than others. Um, all the places that I'm aware of are basically charging retail pricing for their for their mushrooms. They're very expensive. Two thirteen, like thumbs up right now? No way. Are they? There's just two thirteen number of people on. I never get that many thumbs up. <laughs> Probably because I don't bring it up enough. Here, hold on. I need to take a looky see. What does this look like? It's like 75. 75 thumbs up. Uh, let's see, Dharma Bum. Are you familiar with using Melifix for either coral dip or as a preventative in quarantine? Heard Julian Sprung mention it randomly as an inspiration for Revive. Um, I have not tried that. I, I don't know what the active ingredient in that is. Is that a, like an antibacterial? Brea07, first time here, how do you order and how much for shipping? Good question. So if you go to titlegardens.com slash live, you can see where, you'll see an embed of this video, but below that you'll see a numbered list of corals. So for example, right now we're at item number 64 for $25. If you like this Blue Moon Chalice, you just take item number 64, put it in your shopping cart and check out just like a regular item. Shipping is a flat rate $39.99 and it's free over $250.
Now, it's always a good idea to kind of check out more frequently if you're looking at a number of different items uh, because uh, you only get the item when you've completed the shipping, or I'm sorry, when you've completed the checkout process. So in order to avoid getting multiple charges for shipping, you can select as a shipping method live sale slash adding to an existing order. And that basically sets the shipping price to zero. Hollywood Stunners is only second to Galaxia for me for annoying and long sweepers and aggression. That's a, a fairly common thing in a lot of large polyp stony corals. Uh, some are, are more aggressive than others, and I think that Hollywood Stunners' fast growth rate also contributes to that. But everything that's on a reef is trying very hard to kill off all its neighbors and take over more real estate. So certain ones do it like you, like you see with, uh, with sweeper tentacles, others do it through chemical warfare, others do it through ejecting like mesenterial filaments through its skin, basically digesting the neighbors around it. Uh, there's all manner uh, of ways that you know, corals try to kind of find their way to take up more space and reproduce more. So it's kind of something that you, that you as, a, as a reef keeper have to manage. And I know you're not asking for advice, but this is kind of like more of a general thing. So sometimes when people are setting up new tanks, um, they might be a little bit overzealous and place everything too close together. And within like a couple of months, you end up with what used to be 10 corals is now down to about two because they were the toughest or the most effective at eliminating all of its, all of its nearby neighbors. Jake Bentley won $500 refund from BRS today. Congrats. I think I'm going to have to take the money I save and spend it here on new corals. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And uh, definitely thank BRS for me once you do. No, those are cool guys. And you know, the thing about BRS, which I, I do really appreciate coming from like my segment of, of YouTube, is that they're very big on the educational and informational space. It's not purely like entertainment. So I definitely, you know, I, I appreciate their work because they do really like really good concise videos that do take quite a lot of investigation on their part. So they're definitely a great resource. And I mean, the, the, the types of resources available to people now compared to when I was starting up, it's like, a billion to one it's we we had to do everything the hard slash stupid way and now you know there's there's places that are like great informational resources <clears throat> travis lund any euphilia i know for a fact travis there's one euphilia but I don't know if there's many of them, unfortunately, on this show anyways. I think we might have some on the website, but I don't think we have any on this show. We have one, it's the very last coral, and it's expensive, but um, I don't remember she, like, you know, we I shoot all of these corals ahead of time, and I've shot so many for so long now, that they just all kind of blend together. So I don't, I don't remember like, was that on this show? Was it on like the last one? I don't, I don't know where I am anymore. <clears throat> Any tips on chalices? I can't seem to keep them alive. So Lin N, chalices and not being able to keep them alive. So the thing about chalices is that it's, it's this blanket term that covers like 20 different genera of corals. So like Echinopora is a genus, um, Oxypora is a genus. So there, there's like literally like 20, okay? And the care requirements are kind of like all over the map. So if you're struggling with one kind, um, it could be a particularly sensitive kind, whereas other types are bulletproof. I would kind of look at the source first because sometimes uh, 
elegance, or I'm sorry, elegances, chalices that are brought in, they're rough to begin with. And some of the more sensitive ones are going to be really challenging just to, to get in in that state and then have recover. Then again, others are just completely bulletproof. Like we were talking earlier about Hollywood Stunner, uh, Blue Moon Chalice, like indestruct, practically indestructible LPS. But there's some really delicate ones too. Jeff Kennedy, thanks so much for the $5 super chat. And Ernie Wallace, $10. Happy holidays, Dan. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate every bit of that, believe me. You guys help me pick some of this up. Which I should probably start drinking at some point here, huh? <laughs> Tech your talk. We walked uphill both ways in the snow. I've got even one... I'll even one-up that. I lived... I don't know how many miles away, maybe like a few miles away from, from school. And I had to walk on the railroad tracks in the snow back home and occasionally had to dodge the trains. It was a good time. So I did that for two years before I got my driver's license in high school. So yeah, these kids have it real easy. They can just Uber wherever they want. Because somehow, I don't know why I think this, but I think just kids just have money. <laughs> they can just Uber everywhere. Uh, Harkins, any scolies? Uh, there isn't a Scully on this show, but there is an Acanthophilia. And two, please, thanks for uh, again for putting the, the, the link out there for the barbecue. We need to do a better job. Well, it's not that we're doing a bad job. It's just so far away. But yeah, just keeping it you know, in people's minds that there's going to be the summer get-together. Hopefully many of you can make it. Uh, and actually, um, the other day that uh, I was having a, uh, a dinner with Rico and his wife and we did mention Lisa like Lisa we're trying to get you down from Toronto to come visit us Tattoo dancer 91 what's up title gardens speaking of coral warfare I've discovered that GSP can disintegrate suspicious area very brutal and to start pruning It is kind of weird as to what kills what and it's kind of a, a morose thing to to figure out but yeah, it is weird like some some things are completely not what you would expect. For example, Hydnophora has like a really, really rough sting, can kill off all kinds of other SPS. If a mushroom encroaches on it, that mushroom wins. Like the little smooth discosoma that doesn't really seem to sting anything will absolutely annihilate Hydnophora. Two please with another $1.99. Catch me if you can. <laughs> Oh, I just assumed it was sake in the mug. No, not just yet. Wolf the Fallen, got my ticket for your BBQ, can't wait for it. What? I got a phone call, what? It rang once. It shouldn't ring at all. So here's a nice thing about, oh, it's Sigi. Hold on, what's he want? I don't know. Sagi's in chat. Like, I don't know why he's calling me. <laughs> Maybe he butt dialed me. I, I want to come and I'm planning on it. Can't wait to meet you guys. It's, it's a good time. Um, I have to say that, that Akron, Ohio is a slightly less cosmopolitan than Toronto, but we'll do what we can. Uh, speaking of A cans, this is Jake Bentley. I picked one up from my LFS and it's been struggled from the second I put it in my tank. Nitrate, phosphate, all seem to be in line. Not sure what to do for it. So this is also an observation that I made with regard to A cans, and I'm, and I'm guessing by A can you really mean like Micromusa Lord Hoensis. Uh, but a lot of Micromusa Lords are really fragile when they come in. So unless your LFS has been propagating them. Uh, they're kind of a really delicate species to work with. It's, it seems kind of counterintuitive because they are kind of a very middle-of-the-road difficulty LPS. But when they're freshly imported, I think they, they kind of have to be doted on, and feeding really helps. Like, I think when they're really fat, they always have their tentacles out, like day and night. 
that's really how you want them to look. Like when they come in kind of that fresh off the boat look, they're tiny, um, they're kind of like sunken in, and oftentimes they're so expensive that stores have to immediately start cutting them into like smaller pieces to then sell. And they weren't really good cutting candidates to begin with. So I think, you know, I would put a priority on feeding because it doesn't seem like your water chemistry was the issue. But oftentimes, uh, like they're just, they're just so like suffering from malnutrition, kind of have to watch out for that. Tina's Reef, hello everyone, finally catching Dan while he's still alive. Yeah, and we're, uh, this is gonna be the longer show too. So we're gonna be going all the way up to 200 and something. So plenty of time left. Lisa, I need to start a GoFundMe for a plane ticket for the BBQ. <laughs> Yeah, so we're, we're trying to ease the economic burden of that. Um, and while I probably can't pay for everybody's plane tickets, I've kind of got some other bills I have to pay. Um, we are working with some companies and everything like that for gift bags. And we hope to have quite a lot more in value. So like the, the, the $25 uh, barbecue ticket price, we hope to get like, 10x that for for the gift bags and everything and for so my, my concept for that barbecue thing is not just oh it's just for local people i want as much as possible to kind of um to bring like the live show aspect into it so the people that couldn't make it can still kind of participate to some degree by you know by at least hanging out digitally and on top of that we're gonna have uh like these these gift bags for people with just you know merch and product like product samples and whatever else and i think like every hour on the hour i would like to do some sort of giveaway like on on whatever live platforms there are and just you know like because we're hopefully we'll have like enough to to send out you know several more than just the number of people that attend and i think that's a good way to kind of you know give back to the people that couldn't make it but still support us. Wolf the Fallen, my lords are always hungry. That's, like I said, that's a really good sign. When we had our, our most success, our best success with them was when we had tanks that were very easy to feed where we could turn off all the flow, like broadcast feed everything, and then come back 20 minutes later, turn the flow back on. I think right now, some of our uh, LPS aren't getting the nutrition that I would like them to get because it's the way that we had set up the tanks is a little bit more difficult and or difficult to turn everything off for feeding and that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, Mice's shrimp slurry should be good um, and if you also uh, want to try like some powdered plankton stuff a lot of different products uh, are pretty good for that and they encourage uh, like that feeding response in, in LPS. Harkins Aquatics gonna try to make it awesome. Look forward to seeing you. J Reg, yeah mine are always puffed up and tentacles out feed every other day. It, it's it's really kind of binary in that way. It's either that or they're dying. <laughs> I've never seen like the, the in-between except when they are freshly shipped from Australia. Jeff Kennedy, well, it's a four hour drive to Tyler Gardens for me. That's not bad. Uh, some people have come from super far. At least it is a drive distance. Tyler Gardens, I just discovered that what you thought was a Leptoceras is a green Pavona. This is why I watch you despite being European. Thanks for the knowledge and answers. Cheers. So, Tattoo Dancer 91. So, Pavona, Leptoceras, and Samacora are really difficult to tell apart, like really, really difficult. So there, don't be surprised if some things get juggled around, uh, just because uh, when you start to like, because if somebody said, "Oh, this is a Samacora," and then that's just kind of what the internet has deemed uh, something to be, I'm like, "Cool, I'll go with it." 
but sometimes you like keep looking at it, keep looking at it, keep looking at it, and then one day somebody here will misidentify it. And then I look at it, I'm like, yeah, I could see it being a pavona. You know, that can totally happen. They're, they're, they're really, yeah, they're really difficult to distinguish sometimes. Dan running an announcer's box to grill like a wrestling match stream. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, I don't think that we're allowed to have like actual wrestling matches. Otherwise, I would totally do that at the barbecue. <laughs> I don't know why that popped into my head. Ozzy Dan, first time I've been able to watch you live from being in Australia. I wish I could purchase some of your amazing corals. Oh, thank you. Um, I I'm glad that you like them. A lot of, you know, basically, you guys in Australia are the only people that are shipping <laughs> corals right now. It's like you guys, Vietnam and like Tonga and the, 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 the coral quality from Australia is like a like a step above. So really, like you guys are the whole industry right now. So a lot of the stuff that you see here that's not from Australia, it's purely because of aquaculture. The lords are bipolar corals, it seems, kinda. Uh, okay, love of Koei orchids and gardening. You would, you would get along with people here. <laughs> we love Koei. My parents love orchids. My mom loves gardening. Favia, best care to get small broken pieces going. I've heard they're slow growing. Favia, if it's true Favia, are very slow growing. Uh, one of the slowest growing corals. LTS corals. Or corals, period, at that point. As far as like what's the best way to um what's the best way to get them going i would make sure that they're they're attached securely so there's no chance of them getting jostled or anything like that or getting thrown around the tank that's very important but then feeding is almost like the, the go to fix a whole bunch of problems if you can directly feed corals uh That'll go a long way. There is a way to overfeed corals. You don't want to do that. You don't want to pollute your tank. You don't want to burn out the corals because sometimes like the powders and, and, and the pellets and stuff like that, overfeeding that can actually damage them. So be careful of that. But a little bit of moderate feeding, maybe three times a week, will do wonders for you. wrestling match at the barbecue just tell people who wants this ex coral to fight for it it's like bum fights for corals <laughs> good grief that would be a new low for me reef boy what's your favorite sps coral right now i would have to say i'm really enjoying a lot of the acropora um so a little bit of history of this operation. We've struggled keeping Acropora for many years. Uh, our greenhouse is um, not exactly ideal for growing a lot of SPS, and especially Acropora that tends to be the most temperamental. So once we were able to kind of iron out a lot of those issues, um, this is the first year that we've actually had fantastic coloration of Acropora all summer long and then into winter where the colors tend to perk up anyway. So like right now, um, the, the colors that we're getting, super encouraging. Uh, and I expect that to, to continue through the rest of the winter. Unfortunately, I haven't really been able to, um, to get like any of like the really exotic ones just because it's a little scary because we've had so many issues in years past keeping acros that you know i'm not about to go spend 500 dollars on, on a one inch piece of anything but you know it's something i would like to get into once we have um the new systems up and running probably right around barbecue time Is that the correct pronunciation? I'm assuming uh, it's Koei. 
Yeah, Koei is the correct pronunciation. Everybody here in the Midwest says Koi. Wrong. Great advice. I'll keep my three pieces fixed as they're being knocked about. Yeah, that'll do it. I read a molecular study on day, and they are determined that Pavona and Lepto really weren't distinct enough for them to be different. So Chris McLaughlin, um, I would entertain that argument. They're really darn similar. Uh, so it's funny, one of my suppliers, he purchases um, what we call a blue Pavona, and he is convinced that it's a Leptoceras, except that in his tanks, all the Leptoceras die, but the blue one does not. <laughs> so, I mean, there's there are like, it could be a total, total anecdotal, one-off type things, but they do look very similar, and... I can't imagine like finding real world differences, except I just gave you a real world difference. One died, one didn't. But um, yeah, when it comes to coral taxonomy, it's it's like a constantly shifting mosaic. It's not like, oh, this is set in stone type stuff. I mean, just the whole thing about acans and micromusa. Acan lords are now micromusa lords. And like stuff like these are just terms that we're hoping to better understand these corals. If I told you that something is a Leptoceras, and somebody says, no, that's not a Leptoceras, that's a Pavona, or that's a Samacora. Does that materially change anything that you are about to do? Probably not. So what we tend to do as far as like nomenclature actually isn't so much uh, scientific journal based, unfortunately. It's more Google search based. It's what Google decides. So I missed the coral that Adam is talking about. Is that a rainbow monty? Looks like a Superman. A lot of Supermans do. The the difference is the additional colors on the new growth. And I think I know which one you're talking about. I don't see it on my screen right now, but yes, it is a Superman. It's the it's the um, there's there's patches of orange and green coming up. But yeah, a lot of it is red and blue. I do agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. I was today years old when I found out I've been saying Koei wrong my whole life. Well, I mean, if, if it's all you hear, right, it's like there's not a ton of like native Japanese speakers, at least where I'm around. Uh, Paul is asking on Facebook, hey, Akron Lograd here, go Zips. I'm sure you get this asked 200 times, but do you do local pickups? Yes. Uh, we just need to schedule a visit in advance and any corals that you purchase online, you can pick up in person, and also you're free to um, to shop locally as well. So Ozzy Dan is asking, started fragging and selling zoas. That's very cool because Australian zoas are highly, highly in demand and the stuff that gets pulled out of the ocean not awesome so if you are able to cultivate those that's very very that's very good for you any tips on keeping a zoa only frag tank so my issue with zoas is that they are like magnets for a million kinds of pests so i would i would stay up on keeping them very clean and even like periodically uh, dipping entire like racks or colonies of them. Now, once you have like you know all, all your predator pest predators in place, you don't have to worry about that quite so much. But um, the, the the cleanliness of them not only keeps each particular growth like healthier and happier and better looking, but it also will drastically increase how fast it grows.
Um, Marcus Aurelius 187, Recordia now anemone or were they always? I always thought they were coralomorphs. Uh, got any green Duncans? Still like them in my tank. So Mike Nielsen, I don't know if there's one on this show or not. I do remember filming it, but I don't know if it was for this show or if it was, if it was for the last show. We do have them. Tina's Reef got hit by a bad snowstorm. There's a tree down in the neighborhood. Oh, that sucks. Any palytoxin stories from fragging zoas? You know, it's like the exact opposite here. With, with the number of zoas that we go through, you would think that we would be extra at risk. The, the stuff that I don't like handling are like true palytholas. Um, I think a lot of stuff gets called a pally if it's just like a big zoanthid, and those are still very clearly zoas. But pallies are kind of their own thing, like Palliophila grandis, like purple death, nuclear green, that type of form. Or, and just like the, basically those big green ones or the big grayish ones. I don't like messing with those. Uh, they are, I mean, the, 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 the slime they produce it like makes me just like wig out and sometimes like when I when I handle one of those and just get like the mucus on my hands like my mouth tastes funny and I'm thinking yeah I'm not gonna mess with this thing so I, I actually don't frag that stuff and if somebody wants that you know obviously you know I make them aware of all the issues with it and I'll just sell them the entire thing I don't even want to be cutting that stuff at all There are like palytoxin stories from like somebody locally that lost a dog and then one person that actually got palytoxin poisoning himself and had all kinds of health issues for a very long time. Uh, Vero, if I came from Canada to purchase corals, do you think there would be any problems getting them over the border? There's a lot of problems getting them over the border. That is an entire huge problem. Um, Nothing CITES can be moved across the Canadian border without proper documentation. Um, but like soft corals and stuff like that, I think you can carry. You will definitely need to work that out in advance. Pallies are evil. I scrubbed a rock and got poisoned. Yeah, I would never scrub a rock of pallies. Yeah, like never. Besides size differences, how do we know a zoa from a pally? So one of the big differences that I, that I kind of look at is just like the, the tentacle structure, like the, the pointiness of those tentacles. Um, and th th so there's like the official... Um, like scientific description, which if I read it to you, it wouldn't mean a whole heck of a lot to you. Maybe it would, didn't mean a whole heck of a lot to me. But the, the tentacles themselves look a little bit different. How reactive they are is a little bit different. And also they incorporate substrate into their flesh to a much greater degree than I would ever see happen in a zoa colony. So most of the things in this hobby are zoas. Very few things are actually Palliophila. Two please was Dev from Reef Dudes. He has no issues bringing things over. Um, I think as long as it's not stony corals, like you really shouldn't be taking stony corals across borders. So Mad Michael's asking, any plans to ship internationally in the future? It's, it's difficult to work up the scale to where international shipping makes sense. It's possible, but um, rather unlikely. There's a lot of hurdles, and there's, there's like a big volume requirement that where it wouldn't make sense. Otherwise, it's extremely expensive. 
Uh, Dayton Dingman, how do you weigh all the BS with all the salt mixes out there? Um, here's the thing about salt mixes. How different from each other really should they be, right? Because they're like the idea is that you're trying to replicate a natural standard. Theoretically, most salt mixes should be really, really, really darn close to one another. Marketing-wise, though, like you have to differentiate yourself from your competitors, and you can do it through price, you can do it through quality control, you can do it through all these other methods. But yeah, it's 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 tricky, isn't it? Um, I went with the a, a company that makes its salt in Ohio locally, and a lot of it has to do with logistics. Uh, the price was right, and they were able to to make the, the deliveries in something that worked out for me in sizes that I needed and, and whatnot. So a lot of like the reasons why I went with a particular brand, which by the way is Omega C, um, is not chemistry related as much as it is logistics. John Rivas on Facebook is asking, does iodine work for Zoadip? Uh, iodine is an antibacterial, and so it can work in some ways. And there, there's some anecdotes about how Zoas use iodine. Um, I mean, iodine is, is available in such small amounts in salt water that I don't know if it's quite that sort of thing. But it, I think that if you're knocking down potential bacterial issues, it might help in that regard. Is this an exclusive encrusting coral show? Uh, no, there's, there's all types. There are all types. Uh, Ozzy Dan, any thoughts on using natural salt water? Um, I have never tried it. I'm kind of landlocked here in Ohio, but I think it would be interesting to try. Now, when people do do that, uh, there's quite a lot of processing that happens on the front end. So it's not like, oh, we're just taking water from the ocean and using it. That might have really, really bad results. Mark Cross says, I've used Omega for a while. Great stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, sometimes it's just about the relationships that you make. Like the the, the rep for Omega uh, just like reached out and we were able to like just work on a deal. It's just all very informal. And you know, that's probably why you're seeing a, a whole lot of um a, a lot of Fritz salt uh, being advocated. It's just because like Sean, the 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 um like the sales face of Fritz Industries, I mean he's like such a gregarious uh, you know, guy like he's like he just he he definitely is like this great salesperson and like I don't even know if like I well maybe some people are like oh they're all about that Fritz chemistry but I mean who really tests their salt to that degree at all right I think a lot of it is just relationship building so yeah I, I can definitely see like why I see like Fritz five years ago I've never heard of them until about like two years ago and then they're, they're just everywhere now and I think a lot of it has to do with just like you know like the salesmanship and uh, it was funny like the other day Rico was saying you should switch to Fritz and I'm like I'm not a salty ninja I'm not like evangelical about about salt in any way shape or form but and he was like and so the reason why he wanted me to switch to Fritz was because he's using Fritz and wants someplace local that he can pick it up from. <laughs> so there you go, right? It's it's not for any like actual actual coral reasons. It's like all logistics and comfort and comfort essentially. Then should I buy a hundred dollars worth of copepods or a hundred dollars of uh of Caribbean live rock? Okay. You fix it in your second post. Um, uh, I would do the $100 worth of copepods because I think Caribbean Live Rock is illegal. I'd go with that. Danny's Reef. I've used Instant Ocean Reef Crystals for 10 years with great results. I've used Instant Ocean Reef Crystals for a very long time too, probably also about 10 years. Um, again, going back to logistics, it is very difficult to get um, pallet quantities of reef crystals on a pup truck delivered. And that's why I don't, oh, and they have weird pricing too. 
where it's like it's like a, a discounted rate for like a little while and then a higher rate for a different part of the year and, a, and then like little pockets of discount rate which everybody buys or sells at that time. Very strange. What idiot had given a thumbs down? I'm not even worried. Like thumbs ups, thumbs ups and thumbs downs have like no bearing on YouTube. It's, it's, you know what, it's probably Sean from Fritz. He's like, what do you mean you don't like my chemistry? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, do you sell Copa Pods? I don't. They, they come on everything. Like if you just buy corals from us, it's gonna, you're gonna get some Copa Pods. Uh, let's see. Do you think a six bulb fixture, uh, four Carol blue plus? Oh, Jake's Jake's having some problems with with the keyboard. It's going to give decent par for a tank that's eighteen inches deep. Yeah, six bulbs is a ton of power. You know, it's a ton of power. Like uh, four, uh, four probably Coral plus two, four Coral blue plus. Those are two different bulbs. Um, a two octanic, no, that's a ton. <laughs> James Aiken, sailing the ship and a nice beard sold. <laughs> no, he, he's, he's, a, he's a good dude. I, I've only met him the one time. He's really, really, really good host. I, I met him at Aquashala. Poor guys are probably exhausted from putting on that show and still, you know, like was kind enough to spend some time and, and talk with us. I use six ATI, 30 inch tall tank, par is still 200 at the bottom. Yeah, that sounds about right. Now the thing about, about T5s that you do have to realize is that um, they do have a drop in power output. I think BRS did a video talking about, you know, it's, it's not as much as people thought it was, but it's still something that you might want to replace your bulbs every 12 to 18 months. We don't replace our bulbs. It's so weird. We just don't like. I think we've had our ours running for like a couple of years now. <clears throat> uh, my my LFS has some. I'm, I'm guessing that's going back to the Caribbean live rock. Guess or wholesaler or sketchy. It's like, it's if they're if you if you're in the U.S. with Caribbean live rock, that's like a felony. It's bad. Okay, so Jerome Jeffers just joined the stream. How does the live sale work? So best tip is to go to titlegardens.com slash live, and there you'll see this video as well as the entire list of corals. So for example, we're currently on item number 116. That's the forest green Acropora for $10, and there's 10 of this particular coral available for the show. So if you did like it, you'd go to item 116, Toss it into your shopping cart just like any regular item, and then check out. So shipping is a flat rate $39.99, and it's free once your order total goes over $250. Now, I recommend that you check out more frequently, especially during like a busy live show like this, because in order to actually get the coral, you have to complete the checkout process. And if somebody just puts a whole bunch of stuff in their shopping cart and checks out at the very end, a lot of that other stuff might have been sniped along the way by other viewers. So if you do want to check out more frequently, which is fine, multiple orders are fine, just make sure that you select local pickup slash live sale slash adding to an existing order. That way you don't get charged multiple instances of shipping. But that's basically how that works. And all of that is spelled out on that page. There's actually a link that takes you to like um, a more long-winded version of what I just said. Ah, uh, he could be talking about Carib Sea Live Rock. Okay, that, that's, that might be. Now, I think, I wonder if like there could be like the land-based stuff that's put in the ocean and then brought back out. There was something, there were some people doing that for a little while. Um, 
Yeah, so I think I, and Jay Ragged just brought that up too. Do they still not sell leases on federal offshore for live rock production? That's something to, to check into. I um, It's been a while since I've seen that. And you know things could have changed. I do remember that they, they did have that activity, but it, it's been so long since I've ever even heard of anybody buying it, which makes me wonder if it was still available. Something to, to, to look into though. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, 187. Anybody buy that hot pink style? It was definitely hot looking. Okay, to put things into perspective as far as that coral is concerned, you could turn the lights off and it still looks like it's glowing pink in the tank. And you could take it out of the water and it's still like bright pink. It's the craziest looking thing right now. That was one of the SPS that did really well um, this entire summer. Uh, Johnny Utah, do amphipods molt? I think so, yes. Uh, this is Johnny Utah on Facebook. I have some pretty big ones in my tank and they seem to irritate my zoas. So yeah, I think large copepods, large amphipods, Excuse me. I think they can mess with stuff like zoas. Like I've actually had them be so big and aggressive that they like killed and ate a, a cucumber, a sea cucumber. That was like messed up. Uh, so it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility that you're messing with your zoas. I would probably just try to feed your tank more, and that'll kind of like get them away from the zoas, because I think like given the choice between like free-floating food and zoas, they're going to be going elsewhere. Evan Luo, nice, I finally caught this live. Can't buy anything though, because I'm in Australia. No worries, glad you could make it. Hang out, have a drink. I see a flower pot coral in the back. Yeah, so we, we switch between um, we switch between having like the black background and going with no background at all. And they, they both kind of have a cool aesthetic, you know, like the, the black background makes everything look really sharp, really clean, really crisp. But kind of having that out of focus, colorful background is kind of cool too. So I don't know which one I like better. They're both kind of good in their own ways. Danny's Reef, I'm never starting a tank with live rock again. Just buy dry rock, introduce pods and such. Tired of hitchhikers coming on rocks, just my opinion. That's a definite selling point to starting with dead rock. It's, it's the, the hitchhikers. And like, there's no hitchhiker quite like getting like a blue crab or something that turns into like a 12 inch monster. Yeah, my, li my LFS does not sell live rock in water to prevent pests. Yeah, I mean that's it is that is the the real big downside. Now having said that, like real live rock, there's nothing quite like it. I mean it's it's how light and porous it is. It's amazing. And it, it has a very different consistency and everything like that. Because like the stuff that you you get like mined up out of the ground, I mean it kind of looks like live rock, but it's like way more dense. And I, I wonder if chemically that rock is just different. And yeah, it's just something that, that I was just thinking of because like the, the, the real live rock that I remember getting from Indonesia way back in the day was a very different thing. They ate a sea cucumber, yes. I literally watched them bite a sea cucumber to death. It was awful. I bet that cucumber was already dying. Uh, the cucumber was introduced to my tank and within five minutes was bitten to death. Like it was, it was a new addition into the tank. It was crazy. And I haven't seen any really large pods, but I know that they can be gigantic, like bunny sized. Mantis shrimp are pods, so real big. Yeah, there's some big ones. And like the deep sea stuff, like super creepy. Mm.
Title Gardens provided me with enough info and confidence to begin a reef tank. I just wanted to say thank you. Aw, thank you. I'm glad you liked the videos. Biggest threat to a reef tank. Easy. Neglect. Like, pretty much, there's only really one reason why like reef tanks are successful. It's the person taking care of it. Like, no amount of technology can save you from that. Like if I could give you like a fifty thousand dollar budget, do as much automation as you like, it's gonna still be all up to you to make sure that thing works out well. I ran out of other stuff to do, so like I ran out of oranges, ran out of water, so now I'm onto the sake. Yeah, this stuff's really good. So of all places, I got this from my deli. Like, I, I don't think, oh, you know what? I can find some high-end sake at a deli. So I know that this, this stuff is good because um, when I went on vacation to Japan, I actually went to this place. And um, yeah, they make the good stuff. My only fear is bobbit worms. Yeah, they're nice. Bobbit worms. They're curious animals. Yeah, it's documenting on, on Arctic, some isopods are the size of footballs. Yeah, basically. Than, uh, so this is Evan asking, Than, what's your thoughts on being able to grow sponges from a dry rock start? Um. You can, you definitely can. I mean, they might not be the sponges that uh, you necessarily like. Uh, a lot of like the, the sponges that do well in home aquariums tend to not be very pretty. So the really pretty ones that you get from live rock tend to die over time. Whereas the ones that stick around tend to be kind of brown or white. Uh, we have tons that are growing and we haven't had live rock. I mean, the, the last time I bought live rock, it was 1997, to give you an idea. So all the rock since then has been dead. Uh, real quick, Facebook, Johnny Utah, vermetid snails. I swear to crush 20 a week. Anything that eats them? I've heard of stuff eating them. I've never personally... Uh, what? Okay, so real quick in chat. There was something that anecdotally ate vermetid snails. Was it, I don't think it was a crab, I don't think it was a shrimp, it might have been like another type of snail. But regardless, I think the best way to get rid of vermetid snails is doing exactly what you're doing. I would uh, physically remove as many as I can. Hopefully you don't have like some gigantic aquarium because that would be, you know, quite a lot of work. Um, aren't you supposed to drink it warm? Uh, no, not necessarily. You can you can have chilled. You can actually chill or warm this. <laughs> Drinking on the job. Love of koi orchids and gardening. You are new to this whole thing. <laughs> I, I don't I don't drink a ton in general, but pretty much whenever I do drink, it's always on camera. So if you look back at all of my live shows, there's probably ten streams that I've done where I drank, and. Um, that might have been, like, I would say that that, that is probably like 90% of all the times that I've drank the entire time. So I usually have, have drinks less than 10 times a year. Definitely less, definitely less than 10. So you guys get to, you guys get to enjoy it with me, I guess. Sponges use spores to reproduce, right? I don't know, Dayton. Do you have to drink sake from an Alice in Wonderland teacup? So this teacup thing came with the bottle. So it was like flipped onto this thing. And yeah, you don't necessarily want to drink it in like a big stein. It doesn't take a whole lot of sake. I mean, sake is not super alcoholic. It's like about as much as like a bottle of wine, I think. Uh, let's see, if you had to choose three corals, what would they be? Mm. I don't even know if I could do that. 
three corals. I have no idea. <laughs> He's a lush. Jesus, I've had drinks more than 10 times this month. Most people do. Most of my friends do. Luckily, they're all in, in Michigan. So I'm not like, I'm not influenced by them tremendously. I, I swear they have drinks every night. I, I, I wouldn't even doubt it. Like the last time um, we did the live show with them was Halloween. And Suzanne and I, basically, if you watch the Halloween live show, that was basically Suzanne and I getting completely trashed over the course of three hours. I mean, we, it was a mess. I threw up that night. Keep drinking. You're talking like you're super relaxed and taking your time to explain everything. A little is good. Uh, where's the Sapporo fan? That's a good question. You know, I have a hard time tracking down Sapporo. Um, of all like the, uh, the, the Budweiser class Japanese beers, Asahi is my favorite. Don't ask me why. I just, I was gravitated to, to, to Asahi more than Sapporo or Kirin. Evan, thank you so much for the fourteen ninety nine. Appreciate your work, man. Keep the videos up. I'm trying the, the the video production side of things. Sometimes, like it's there's like this equivalent to um, like writer's block that I get on video making, and sometimes it's like there's so much uh, I have to do for like these live shows that it did it kind of distracted me a little bit from the videos, actually making real videos, not like live streams. And so hopefully, you know, I'll get more back into that because there is a ton of videos that I do want to make. Yeah, vermetids are like roaches. I've literally bayered them and they came back. Yeah, you can't dip them. Dipping does nothing. Can you dose sake? So I, I was I did mention this earlier about about the sake brewery place, but like what makes them special is like the water that's available there. And having like tasted that water, it's it's incredible. So uh, I bet you know whatever. So this is just rice rice wine. So if people are carbon dosing with vodka, I can't imagine you couldn't carbon dose with sake. I just don't think it's a good idea because it's so much more expensive. What are those corals that are shaped like a slice of pizza? I don't know. Could be a Montipora. Sometimes when we cut Montes, they turn out that way. Certain chalices might. Let's see. <clears throat> All videos are good. As long as you're talking, I'm listening. Thanks. I've heard Levamisol works. I haven't tried it yet. So I have tried Levamisol. Um, I don't know if it kills remedids. Like levamisol is really harsh, and unlike a uh, coral rx or something, which is like a like a dip, levamisol you treat your tank with it. But generally, you're trying to eliminate um, flatworms with levamisol, and it is very effective for that. Now, the problem that I have with levamisol is that it's so aggressive that like, I mean, my fish are so upset for days and days. And not only that, but I mean, you put this in your in your water, and everything just dies. Like, not not the corals, but I, it, it's it's snowing, like dead critters, like everywhere. It's so so harsh. Uh, on Facebook, PJ Bubsy, I've seen several Alviopora on your sale. What are good care guides for them? So, we do okay with Alviopora. I wouldn't say that we're fantastic with them. I've noticed that they do a little bit better with, with elevated flow levels. Um, I think they do well with like feeding of like really like small fines and stuff like that. Less so with any kind of, uh, of pellet or anything like that. They'll pretty much reject that outright. But in my one friend's aquarium, he does a lot with like the bacterial stuff, speaking about carbon dosing and stuff. And that kind of has me going down this rabbit hole of, 
of how much bacteria do coral consume for nutrition. And uh, it turns out that everything that I've found indicates they consume a lot of bacteria. And so one of like the benefits to go, going with kind of like an ultra low nutrient ish system is that it encourages like the growth of these bacterial populations. But I don't like to do the actual ultra low nutrient part of it because that part gets kind of sketchy. But I am curious to, to, to do the bacteria promotion part of it because his um, success with both alveopora and Ganiopora, vastly superior to what I'm seeing. And I can only really attribute it to what he's feeding. Yeah, most cures like chemo poison the host, your tank, enough to kill the baddies and not the whole tank. Yeah. Uh, speaking of coral eggs, I can't put my finger on what smells like almost Mr. Clean Citrus. I think it's some, some uh, variety of pine oil. There, there's a few different ones like that that are in that class. I'm sure, it, you know what would be hilarious? That it is basically two cent pine oil and they're charging like $20 for it. <laughs> Getting that 10,000% that markup. Who knows what it is? but it's pine something. Uh, Greg Jones, what's your favorite coral food and why? Okay, so there's different coral foods for different uh, corals, obviously. For LPS, my all-time favorite is the fauna marine stuff from Germany. Like, it has like this weird oiliness to it, and my corals absolutely love it. Uh, as far as kind of the everything else, we make our own concoction of like seafood blend. So it's like a, a mix of mysis and krill and rotifers and stuff like that. Just put it all together, and it has like this like basically the the loose fine like the juice stuff, and that gets broadcast fed over everything. Fan, do you ever get any rhizotrochus? You know what, Dayton? I've literally never owned one. Never once. And Rossi's Coral, Evan Lowe, do you, have you done any modeling? <laughs> Where did you even see his picture? Are you stalking? Is, is Rossi like stalking other people in chat? That'd be kind of funny. Also, uh, PJ Bubsy. Uh, I did a video on alveopora, so if you're ever on YouTube, definitely do a quick search for that and you'll, you'll find uh, our video all about that. And it didn't take very much or very long, but I'm definitely feeling the sound. It's good. Need to tone that down though. <clears throat> Adam, do you like Hannah checkers? Uh, they're okay. Um, we don't use them extensively because we don't do a, a ton of testing. We don't test nearly as much as we should. The nice thing about the Hannah testers is that it, it kind of just like you know, pops up that number right there for you, which is nice. Dayton, when a classic wild comes out, are you going to resub? Oh man, I, no way. There's no way I could. I mean, I don't have enough time to play my phone game and Darkest Dungeon. I mean, which, by the way, like if, if you guys aren't into gaming, um, there's like 3D chess over here, which is like World of Warcraft. And then there's like tic-tac-toe, which is what I'm doing on my phone. And I barely have enough time to play tic-tac-toe on my phone, regardless of like, you know, four dimensional chess on this other end. No way. Not going down that rabbit hole. That's like digital heroin. Uh, Than, thought about selling your own food blend? Uh, sometimes locals will pick up a frozen little thing of it for a few dollars. But shipping shipping frozen stuff, that's its own own issue altogether. Uh, let's see.
Yeah, that's great. My wife is colorblind, so she's no help with the color-based tests. Yeah, in that case, like the HANA test stuff is pretty good. It just gives you that, that one single reading. What should I buy with $250 coral specifically? You know, there's so much you can do, right? A lot of corals really comes down to what you find aesthetically pleasing. I mean, some people have like no budget whatsoever, meaning like cost, no object. They can, they can afford anything they really want. And the stuff that they end up with is the stuff that really makes them happy. It, it's, it has nothing to do with like what I can direct them to saying, oh, but this is high end. That guy doesn't care. He only like that person only cares about what really makes them happy for their tank. So I mean, don't even don't even go down that road of like soliciting other people's opinion about what your tank should look like. That is that is the most personal of decisions. That you're, you'll be way happier going with uh, going with your gut on that. Like other people's tastes, yeah. Okay, Than, what's your favorite one slot in Darkest Dungeon? My favorite one slot is probably either the Leper or the Hellion. <laughs> Wolf the Font, Darkest Dungeon is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Darkest Dungeon is like almost unfair difficult, and that's kind of like the draw to it. It's, uh, it's thematically a very s simple game, but it's also... Um, like the, it's heavily steeped in like Lovecraftian horror, which is kind of cool. I'm a big uh, Lovecraft type type guy. Anything with like Cthulhu type mythos, I'm, I'm I'm all in on. Which is also completely random. Why I thoroughly enjoyed uh, True Detective uh, season one because that was a Lovecraftian horror that was done in the guise of a buddy cop detective crime story. Anyway, Subnautica is really cool on the PC. Got to play that. You know, so I, I have a Mac, so my gaming options are rather limited. I'm I am thinking of once like I'm done, you know, spending my entire net worth on this building. Uh, I do want to build a, a custom PC because I think because I'm not really like super platform like zealous right so I'm not like oh Apple for life it's not like that I, I basically liked Apple for a really long time and I said that I'll switch from Apple when they start to suck and they're kind of starting to suck so um, I have no problems like doing cross-platform stuff like see I got like an iPhone and an Android stuff like that no big deal but I do want to build like an absolute monster of a machine and then the gaming options will expand slightly. But it's not going to get too much more complicated than like Darkest Dungeon type stuff. It's not going to be like uh, like an MMO or anything. Than, do you ever look for that crazy wild coral? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that like that's the only type of shopping that I actually enjoy. Um, kind of getting like the staple stuff doesn't really register in my brain so like the, the fun of the aquaculture aspect of this hobby is that we only need to get like the really nice one or two things every now and again and the idea is to grow that stuff forever so the hunt for just a couple of really top-end corals this is a lot of fun so do i ever look for it yeah i would say i do I'm sure if you visit Tidal Garden's website, you'll soon spend two fifty and get free shipping, right? Pretty much. Yeah, it's it's a really good deal, by the way, because uh, shipping is brutally expensive. Like we charge a flat rate thirty nine ninety nine. I guarantee you, what it costs us to send it to you is way more than that. So yeah, it's a good deal. Oh my God, True Detective was the best. It is one of the best shows on, I've ever seen on TV. Like. I mean, I liked Game of Thrones, like the first three seasons of it. It's kind of not so great right now. Um, I, I, I really liked uh, Breaking Bad, and I like Better Call Saul. But True Detective, I think, is like my all-time favorite TV series. Season one. Season two, like I watched season two before I saw season one. And season two I thought was okay. But season one is like, 
really good. Make you a workstation gaming rig. Oh, let me build it. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe. Like we're, we're actually pretty tech savvy here. Um, and like, I think that I would kind of like take that project on, but at the same time, it's like, I want to get some really, really, really high end, like super powered stuff because I have a, a this, this Apple, it's, it's an, it's an iMac pro. It's like a mid tier iMac pro. So if you know anything about that product line, it's enterprise grade, really expensive components. And it's very strong. It's like, a, this is like a 10 core Xeon processor thing, right? Uh, for me to process this live show that you're watching took over four hours and it's not even image stabilized because ideally I would have stabilized all the footage which would have taken an additional five hours so we're talking like a 10 hour processing time meaning I hit go and then I walk away for half the day and that's with this machine and uh, just so you know, a lot of times people are use Apple for YouTube and stuff specifically because it's very, 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 very fast because of the Final Cut and hardware integration. Meaning that if I went to like Adobe Premiere, I can expect it to take 40% longer. So what was about 10 hours would be basically become about 14 to 16 hours. Yikes. There's a lot of options for rendering CPUs these days. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, Kayvon Torondas is, um, and this might, this it would be insane if this was what we had to do, what would be to like create some kind of team rendering rack based server tower looking thing just to, just to deal with my stuff. I don't want to do that. I really don't, but whatever. Lisa's Aquatics, I'm guilty of never watching Game of Thrones. Okay, so Lisa, uh, I don't know your taste in, um, in series drama, but I can say about the first three seasons of Game of Thrones is gold. It is so good. Uh, and I think after that, they started to run out of the written material a little bit more, and they kind of went their own way storytelling wise and you can tell it gets kind of like tv cut and paste type stuff towards the end but the first three seasons of game of thrones are ridiculously good uh amd with raid zero ssd would be the way to go yeah actually th this computer here has uh some m m.2 um ssds in RAID 0 configuration, like, yeah, like built in. And that's not including my, um, my NAS, which actually, you know, houses all my, all my video files. Uh, Risky Biscuits, are you shooting all your videos in 4K? Yes, I'm shooting it in 4K, 60 frames per second on a cinema camera. Yeah, so it's, so every single coral that you see, okay, every single one, for like 45, 50 seconds, every single one is a gig when I, when I shoot it. After they ran out of books, they got dumb. They really did. Dayton Dingman, you need M.2. I, I, yeah, I, I have it. I, I've, I've got, got M.2 running in RAID 0 on this machine. BRS is about to stream snipe you. Eh. Go for it. Oh, what number are we on? We're in 157. We have, shoot, we have got like an hour left. <laughs> no worries. Check out Peaky Blinders on Netflix. Cool show. I've seen a couple episodes. I haven't got fully gotten into it. I'm sure it gets really good. And early on, they did a, and early on Lynn N, they did a very good job of sticking with the book. Yeah. And the further away from the book they got, I think the worse it got. Uh, risky business can C300, right? No, it's a C200. Uh, the C300 can't do 4K60. It can do 4K, but it's broad, It's more for broadcast, whereas this is kind of for either YouTube or independent raw video. A behind the scenes vid of some of uh, setting up the live show would be cool. So Thomas Osaski, uh, I could do that video and I think it'd be really cool because I think it'll be like an update 
for the studio space once I get I want to get like a couple more things up and going in in the, in the space and then I'd love to do like a a show and tell of kind of like all the stuff that I want to do in here. Can you explain FPS when recording reefs? Sure. So, um I don't know how it looks like on a live stream because there's a lot of um you know, compression artifacts and stuff like that. But where you really can tell um, the benefit of 60 frames per second on like coral videos. So all of my recent videos are all shot in 4K 60. And the difference between 60 and 30 uh, when, is, when it comes to movement, in, at 30 frames per second, a lot of like the, like the movement that you see in coral, like the euphilia and stuff like that, tends to kind of get blurred a little bit at 30 frames per second, but at 60, it looks extra crisp. Now, sometimes people don't like to see stuff shot at 60 frames per second just normally, but for a home aquarium, it looks like you can see like a, almost like a 3D-ish effect. That's how crisp everything looks. The other thing is, even when the coral itself isn't moving, like let's say you're looking at an acropora, not a lot of movement there, but just stuff floating by in the water uh, is so, it tracks very cleanly. And so you get like this sense of depth in the video. So it's very cool still for even for that. Uh, any experience with red dragon coral? Yeah, so if, I'm assuming you're talking about red dragon acropora. Uh, yes. And I don't know if we have any right now. We either sold out of all of it or something happened to it. One thing I do know with Red Dragon is you really can't dip it. it, it that, like the, that, uh, that kind of Acropora responds very, very poorly to dipping. Uh, last time Than told me to watch a show, it was great starting Black Sails. But man, that show got sure got worse. You know what? The last few episodes of Black Sails... I didn't really feel it, but boy, it, it, it did start off good. You have to admit, Deluxe. That, that was like my show until the very end. And I'm like, ugh. But ending a show is the hardest thing, isn't it? That's why like shows like Breaking Bad are so rare, where they, like, they stick the landing. Or True Detective, you stick the landing at the end. Uh, Danny's Reef, I'm new to video editing, but I'm documenting my 300 gallon bill on YouTube. Nice. I found there's a major learning curve. Yes, <laughs> video is its own thing ent entirely. Dayton Dingman, 60 FPS master race. Yeah. All right, I have to go to use the restroom real quick. I will be back shortly. And I'm back. Okay, what did I miss, chat? What does it matter? Your eye can only see 23 FPS, lol. I am sure you're joking. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the 24 frames per second thing is totally a film standard 
because of how cameras worked in the 1940s. Van, we're lost without you. <laughs> Aw. Of course I washed my hands. What are you talking about? I've got, I've got some, nice, uh, some nice bathrooms here in this new building. A lot of people can see well over 60 FPS and birds over 200. So it's, it's actually really simple. You can, um, you can go see uh, like a comparison. Um, like there's these websites that show like a ball moving back and forth. And it's, it's just like a, a, a GIF or something. And they'll show you the difference between like, like four frames per second where the ball is like jittery like this, back and forth, jitter, jitter, jitter. jitter. And then there's like the 24 frames per second, which is kind of like, you know, it's like, it's smooth, it blends a little bit. And then you see like 60 frames per second, it's like really smooth. And you can see, you can see like a difference between 60 and 120 even, and on how smooth that ball moves. Uh, there's a show called Norseman, it's hilarious. I saw, I saw that as a recommended thing on, on Netflix, but I didn't watch it. Gold Strike in 1870s Deadwood, South Dakota, HBO series. Mike Howard. Um, are you talking about Deadwood? Because I, I really enjoy Deadwood. Dayton. Why are the showers so big? That's a good question. I like large showers. So you can fit more people in them. Can you graft all plating Montes? Uh, TMG, I'm really not sure. Um, Grafting Montes is kind of a, a relatively new thing that people have been trying. And um, yeah, it's, it's weird to see what works and what doesn't. The only thing that we have grafted here are two types of paleothyl, a purple death and a nuclear green, if you're familiar with the, what those look like. And we actually have like some that are like half green, half purple, or mostly purple with like a sliver of green. Jeremy Young says, Dan, I see a lot of people going bare bottom on their tanks. What are your thoughts on using stack sliced dry rock for the bottom as a substrate? Um, well, detritus is going to find its way underneath uh, that sliced dry rock bottom. So I would kind of hesitate to doing that. Um, we do plenty of bare bottom tanks at the greenhouse. At the new building, we might do a combination of substrate and bare bottom. One of my friends had a, had a substrate, just took it out very recently. He's gone bare bottom. The, the real benefit to bare bottom, I would say, is that you can really crank up the flow, whereas with a substrate, you don't want that blowing around. Westworld was good, but now meh. I couldn't make it to the second season, and I loved the first season of that. I use aqua sticks to make feet for rocks. Yeah, I could see that. Can you graft Montipora Digi and Montipora Undata? I doubt it. I doubt it. Like, like the actual grafting thing, it's, it's a pretty rare phenomenon. PJ on Facebook. Did I miss the Acantho? If so, what number was it? I don't think you've missed it. If, if, if It might be the second to last thing. So it's not going to be on for just a little while longer. Um, and it's it's a mint chocolate chip Acanthophilia. So it's like the, the green, black and white speckled one. Yeah, when it comes to like the, the substrate bottom, there's... Like e even now, I mean, I've, I've done this hobby forever, seemingly, like 30 something years now. And I mean, I don't have like a strong preference even after doing it for this long as to whether I would go with like a, like a true substrate where the, whether it's like fine sand, slightly like more coarse sand, crushed coral even, 
versus like a bare bottom. I mean, there's there are some benefits to every single type. There's some drawbacks to every single type as well. Uh, I think aesthetically, as long as you're able to keep your sand clean, like the sand really does it for me. Like I love the aesthetic of it. But once you kind of get lax as far as how, you know, how well you clean that sand or you clean that part of your glass where the sand is resting up against and it just turns like cruddy and black looking here. So you have to kind of get in there and like kind of scrape that stuff down and so that you get that white edge on your tank. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, pros and cons to all these things. I think if I had a show tank, which come April I'll have two, um, I would be hard pressed to not use a substrate because I kind of like how it promotes kind of creating its own little ecosystem of sorts. Now, I'm not going to love having to like siphon that out occasionally and things like that, but I think as far as visually what it looks like, it's pretty good. I've done the stacks bare bottom, working well, nice way to display frags potentially, but I've had problems early on with tank chemistry stability. Hmm. Then, yeah, the detritus thing had me looking at reverse plenums. What is a reverse plenum? I know what a plenum is, but what is a reverse plenum? I'm gonna have to look that up as to why they even called it that. And yes, Tina, the purple stylo is really cool. Like for, for whatever reason right now, all of our stylos are looking just particularly impressive. Like this is like almost like peak coloration on it. I just got done taking gravel out of my tank, man, a lot of work. Yeah, you basically have to like vacuum it out slowly. Um, you know, I, I've, in one of my friend's tanks, he has like this giant, um, what are those things called? Like a giant sea cucumber, like a black one. And you can just see the thing working, working, working. But the, the, the tanks that I have that have like a, a substrate, they tend to be like a lot larger and a single one does nothing. <laughs> it just does absolutely, it makes no difference whatsoever. And I think that there could be cool stuff you could do with the bare bottom, just like how um, Love of Koei Orchids and Gardening is saying, where you can grow corals on there as long as you can keep detritus from settling on it. And again, I think that's, a, that's a, kind of like a flow engineering problem more than anything, because once detritus settles on your corals, they're going to have a dead spot right there, right? But and at the same time, if you just blast that, that coral with flow, that's not going to be good either. So finding that happy balance of a coral that, that can, can grow on, on the bottom like that, plus stay, stay clean and not die back from too much flow, it's kind of an interesting quandary. So one of the things that I guess is a, is a perk to having a bare bottom is that you don't have to do as much maintenance. But I find that we tend to scrape the bottom of our bare bottom tanks even. So it's not really less work. In fact, I would say that we do more work on the bare bottom tanks than we do on the non bare bottom tanks, if that makes any sense. And by the way, for all the people that have been placing orders, out of curiosity, are you getting order confirmation emails from us? Because um, I mentioned it earlier in the broadcast, but we're having all kinds of technical issues with the, um, the email hosting. It's, it's, I don't even know if it's a hosting service. It's just basically like this email transactional service to the point where our own accounts were blacklisting our own emails like somehow uh, us getting a copy of our own emails that we're sending out was like getting flagged as like spam or something who knows but anyway our, our account keeps on getting stuck that way so hopefully you guys that haven't actually first of all I hope somebody's placed an order let's start with that 
But then second, of the people that have placed orders, hopefully you guys got confirmation emails. Okay, real quick, Jeremy Young, fam, reverse plenums are where you force filtered return water underneath the substrate, creating uplifting flows that keeps detritus suspended. That sounds like a reverse under gravel filter. Is that, am I kind of like describing that kind of like, an, like a reverse under gravel? If so, I don't know how much I love that. Okay, Brent Bissell, yep, getting confirmations, no problem. Great, thank you. Yeah, just the old reverse under gravel filter idea. Yeah, uh, don't love. Yeah, it's the whole substrate quandary. Like, um, because uh, Rico is, is putting together his tank, you know, he's got some inclinations about substrate versus no substrate. I, I don't even know what he decided on. Do you guys remember? Is he, is he going with, uh, with no substrate? And then my, my other friend, Will, I actually have some footage of his tank when I, when I shot it, but at that point it had substrate and fast forward, it's like a couple weeks and now it has no substrate. Yeah, it's a nitrate factory. I, I would expect it to be a nitrate factory. Yeah, that, that sort of stuff like the, the like under gravel filters and and reverse under gravels, it's just it doesn't make a lot of sense for reef aquariums. It's more of a freshwater thing. And actually I don't even know how good of a freshwater thing it is. He put sand in. That's right he did. That's right. Now I remember. Yeah, he went substrate. Yeah, and now I remember because I was uh, I was wondering how long did it take for the water to clear up. Yeah, I think it's like, it's definitely a cleaner look. I'm kind of jealous just because he uh, he has a tank, whereas I'm still building my building. It's like even if I had a tank now, I couldn't set it up. It'd be full of sawdust in like a few hours. Oh man. <clears throat> There's nothing quite as fun as kind of setting up and planning a new system. I think that's, I, I don't know if you guys are like this, but when I'm um, thinking up a design for a, for a big reef or even a small reef, it's, I have the most fun in like the planning process and in the setting up part. And I think like once it's like kind of done, is when like my happiness with the whole project kind of like plateaus or even goes down it's that the most fun i have is that that initial tinkering construction part of it like once that that tank is like four or five years old it's like it almost like blends into the background it's like it's it, it just gets invisible to my eyes that's i don't know if that's a weird little little personal quirk there but i kind of get that way So Lynn is wondering, how long after you frag your corals before you put them on sale? It really depends. There are certain corals that definitely benefit from uh, like a longer recovery period because ideally you want the coral to be growing down onto um, the plug because just the, the, the glue itself, it's kind of a temporary measure that allows the coral to grow down. So. The long, like the short answer is it depends. The long answer is it could be anything from a couple weeks to like months potentially. So um, I'm looking now right now at like number 184. We probably 
glued it to that thing three weeks ago. And I can kind of tell just by how much overgrowth it has, as well as what the plug itself looks like. Um, if you see something with like a stark white plug, clearly that was uh, a gluing that we did more recently. If it's where you can't see the plug at all, where there's just coral kind of growing over the edge, that should give you an idea that it's been at least a couple months. Lisa, I want to upgrade my tank. I'm also kind of intimidated by keeping coral. It's unknown territory. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Oh, Deacanthus Reef. Like, I didn't even notice that you were here. Like, all I, and the first thing I see is like, gotta go, good night. <laughs> so, sorry, dude, I totally missed, uh, missed that you were even here. So have a, have a good one, man. Um, intimidated by keeping coral. Mm. I would say that most corals these days are easier than fish. I think a lot of times people would have more difficulty um, with like newly acquired fish. That's one of the reasons why I'm not super high on ever like going into like the whole fish selling part of the part of the business. Totally different. Okay, so John Rivas on Facebook is asking, I remember a post from last month. You said that you lost a coral with an aquaforce experiment. Can you de detail that, please? I'm thinking to try out their, their salt, and that post scared me. So, like, real simple. Uh, I didn't use their salt, but I used just about everything else except I didn't do their two-part, or their th two- or three-part dosing thing. Um, this was a while ago, so I, I can't even remember the, the, the thing, the individual things off the top of my head. But it was probably like 10 different chemical thingies. And I wanted to like ease into it. So I was using like half the recommended dosage. And what we first started to notice was like there, were, there was like an immediate change in how the corals looked. Like practically immediate. And immediate, not necessarily good, just different. But I'm like, okay, you know, at least I was actually half expecting that nothing would happen. Like, no, no change whatsoever. We're using half the recommended dosage. In some cases, even less. Uh, so I'm like, it's, it's. I probably just spent a few hundred dollars, and it's not going to be doing much of anything. Which is whatever. But then, like, I noticed like certain things. Like one thing that was weird was. I suddenly notice a sponge about this big in the corner that's like completely white. And the reason why I never noticed it before was it was previously dark purple and I've just blended in with the rocks, but now it's bleach white. So I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay. Fast forward about like a few days and all of a sudden my corals aren't looking not just different, but just worse. Like they're looking dull and then they stopped growing. And then after that, they started just receding and dying one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. So at that point, we were doing daily water changes of, I would say 150 gallons a day around the clock for about three weeks. And in that process, we probably lost at least 30 something percent of our corals. So that was an experiment that went really poorly. Having said that, my friend Will, um, he is 100% aquaforest, and he's he's been happy with his results. Any ideas to mitigate or satisfy the itch to get a bigger tank without actually getting a new tank? Uh, get a screensaver? Well, actually, one thing that's kind of interesting about YouTube is that you can kind of experience the hobby vicariously through other people. Um, and I know this because I was watching this guy's channel called Ants Canada. And no offense to Lisa, but I know there's not a ton of Canadians that are on YouTube because there's just not a ton of Canadians, period. Because this person has 2 million subscribers, okay? And so not a ton of people in Canada. And the name of the channel is Ants Canada. And it's all about like keeping an ant farm if you like, for your home. And I'm just thinking, okay, not only are most of the audience probably not Canadian, but 
I'm going to go ahead and guess that most of the audience aren't keeping ants on purpose. Yet this channel has 2 point something million subscribers. And it's clearly a situation of people vicariously enjoying the ant farm hobby through this channel. So maybe uh, just get onto some channels that do a lot more, you know, kind of like the, the daily vloggy type stuff. But we tend to be more educational informational, so our content is spaced out a lot more. But I'm sure there could be some vicarious benefits to watching some, some things like that. Yeah, and, and going back to the whole Ants Canada channel, sometimes like uh, I talk to other YouTubers and you know they're, they're lamenting about like how they don't want to get caught in a niche that's like too small. I'm like, well, I'm in reef aquariums, it's pretty small. But you know, they're like into like photography. And then so whenever they make a non-photography related uh, YouTube video, like the algorithm just kills them. And they're, they're thinking, I don't want to be stuck in photography. I want to do tech in general. And I'm like, look, if Ants Canada can get two point something million subscribers, you can do it through photography because <laughs> people actually own cameras. People don't own ants on purpose. So anyway, that's my little Ants Canada rant. Ants Canada makes such high quality videos. I think he lives somewhere in Asia, though. Huh. That's a little weird. I would have kind of assumed that he was in Canada. Hmm. What do I know? So hopefully this isn't uh, too terribly confusing whenever... So I, I've, I'm seeing that we're on the item 194 right now, where you know we show that there are multiples of this. So somebody is going to get this actual one, but the item as a whole clearly is not what you see is what you get because we're offering multiples. Uh, so there's a few that you might have seen over the course of the show. Like we have like five of this, we have 10 of that, maybe like an extra one or two of, of something. Um, so you will get something that's basically indistinguishable than what you see here. And going back to uh, a conversation that we had earlier about Pavona versus uh, Samacora versus Leptoceras. This Samacora, it it's only goes by the name Firework Samacora as far as I know. Doesn't that look a lot like Pavona to you? Just like the way that it's, um, like the texture, the, the tentacles, the shape around its eyes. Like, if somebody said, this is not a Samacora, that's a Pavona, I'd be like, cool story. I don't doubt it. So Ants Canada moved to Asia for his ant hobby. That's love right there. And we are coming down the home stretch. So I know, I know there's somebody that was interested in Euphilia, probably long gone. But if you are interested, it is the last one. Somebody was interested in Acanthophilia earlier. It's the second to last coral. So we're almost there to see some of that stuff. So I don't know, guys. What do you think? Do you like the black background or do you like the coral in the background? Dayton Dingman, Dan made tacos. Want some? Yes. I'm hungry. I could absolutely use some food. <laughs> oh, Jeremy, my first colony was harvester ants. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like I, I, was, I just got done talking about like nobody keeps ants on purpose. Uh, Lynn N, is there a way for you to label the coral ordered on the confirmation email? It's hard to remember when all we get is the live sale number. On the confirmation email, it is not possible. However, when we ship the coral, 
Every coral comes labeled with both the item number and the name and the price. Yeah, so part of the reason, so, I mean, we, we get asked a couple of different requests as far as like the live sale goes. So one of the requests is to actually have the picture of the coral rather than just the item number, or uh, right, rather than just the item number. A big part of why we're able to offer lower prices for the live show is because we don't have to do that portion of the work, if that makes sense. So like usually these things are like five, ten dollars less expensive than what is typical on the website. Or in the case of this particular sale, there's some, like some deeper discounts on some of our overstock SPS and, and other items. But um, a lot of that cost savings really does come down to the fact that we just use those number numbers. And they like the coral background. Coral background, Mike Howard likes black. Okay, good to know. Uh, Dayton Dingman, Dan, why are you naming corals? Doesn't that annoy you? Uh, I don't really name these at all. Um, so most of the time when it comes to naming, I am really hoping that there's a name that the internet has kind of gravitated towards for any one of these things. Um, like the last thing I really wanted to be doing is coming up with a name. Uh, ben, if, if he can't, if Ben can't find any name, he'll come up with something. But like, like well, going back to that thing, like that fireworks Samacora, for example, uh, you can look up that on Google and you can find all these examples of it that didn't come from me. And that's kind of what I'd like to, to gravitate to more than anything, because when people search for specific corals, I want them to find that specific coral through me, right? So if I'm naming a ton of stuff, nobody's going to search it by my name because I'm the only one that has ever heard of that name. So that's, I mean, unless you're in a position where you're only getting the craziest stuff that nobody has a name for, then you have to come up with a name, then fine, we'll name some stuff. But one thing that you probably won't ever see us do is throw title gardens in front of a coral name. Like, I'm just not into that into that branding. And Lynn and just said, just said the exact same thing. Worse is when they put their own name on it and charge 10 times the price. They can charge whatever they want. But my problem with the naming thing is if if there is a general consensus on what something is and you decide to name it something else anyway just to be different, I get kind of roll eyes at that. But that's just me. All right, guys, I think this is the last coral. So uh, it is, for me, dinner time. Uh, these two oranges and half a little thing of sake is not going to do it. So hopefully, guys, you enjoyed the live show. Um, I'd say enjoy the rest of your weekend, but clearly that's over. I'm used to, see, to, to talking with you guys on a Saturday or a Friday night. Uh, but yeah, hopefully uh, you enjoyed the, the Cyber Monday and hopefully there's still some, some Cyber Monday deals for you guys to, to get elsewhere. So yeah, what's for dinner, right? <laughs> okay, I will talk to you all later. Uh, and again, thanks so much for, for joining. Uh, thanks all for the super chats and thanks to Patreon. And of course, 